much. Well, hello, everybody. It's summertime. It's hot in Texas. Uh, so before I start, Pastor Keith wanted me to greet you and say that he loved you. He's actually speaking at Relentless Church this weekend. This is his first weekend back to share God's word with people since his heart attack. So it's a really awesome weekend for him to be back at that. And he just wants you to know that he loves you. And I... Um, I actually got the opportunity to sit down with him to talk about our internship college. Some of you guys might not know we have a college here at the church. And we just actually had our graduating class, uh, our graduation happen yesterday. And I wanted to just show you, I wanted to show you really quick about the internship because maybe you're going to school, you've never been to school, or you're figuring out what to do with your life. This might be a really great option for you. And we have a table out in the lobby after the service. So just watch this. Hi, my name is Keila Craft Ambrose. I'm the director here for the internship at Elevate Life Church. And today I'm here with Pastor Keith because we're just gonna have a short discussion about why he created ELI and why it's important. You know, this is a two year accredited program. It's an actual college where they get a degree in biblical studies and leadership. And I think it's so important for everybody to at least consider and look into because it's so unique. It's so unique because it, the same reason that, I, that we established ELI, Elevate Leadership Institute, it's the same reason I wanted to have a family. And that is, I wanted the paradigm of this tribe, in other words, what tribe? This leadership tribe to be reproduced in people's lives. And so we've not only developed curriculum, but we've also got accreditation to do that. So I just wanna clarify, the reason we established this was the same reason I established a family. Because I believe the core values-based life that we've chosen to live, things like honor, things like excellence, things like positive attitude, those are the primary skills you're going to need to do whatever it is that you do in your life. And we built curriculum so to build you emotionally, to build you spiritually, to build you uh, intellectually. And I just think it's, it's, it's really a secret still in our church and I don't want it to be a secret anymore. So if you want more information, go to elcinterns.com. You can actually apply there. And also, just so you're aware, there's a lot of opportunities that you can have, but there's not a lot of opportunities that are going to help you discover, develop, and deploy what God's called you to do. Yeah! So if you're interested in that or have any questions, you can check that out at the table in the lobby. And today, I wanted to share a message with you, and it's something that I'm still in progress with. I don't know if any of you guys are still in progress in anything in your life. But for me, this is kind of like maybe going to be an always in progress thing for me. <laughs> and uh, the title of my message is called Grateful. Grateful. So I did tons of research on gratitude, thankfulness, stuff like that. And the research actually confirms that gratitude effectively increases happiness and reduces stress and depression. This study actually shows us that it helps your brain release neurotransmitters and neurohormones that boost your mood, focus, and clarity of thought. It enhances your mental and physical health. They found out that these people who consciously practiced gratitude were more optimistic, energetic, enthusiastic, determined, interested in life, and happier. They had fewer illnesses and depression. They got more sleep. They were more likely to help somebody else, and they lived longer. Does anyone else in here want to live longer and be happier while we do it and sleep a lot? I don't know about you. I love sleep. Um, yeah, it's a weird thing, but I really do. So for me, it's interesting to know that gratitude's like a secret weapon in our life. And, you know, in Psalms 34, 1 through 3, it says, I will thank the Lord at all times. My lips will always praise him. I will find my glory in knowing the Lord. Let those who are hurting hear me and be joyful. Join me in giving glory to the Lord. Let us honor him together. So before I started my message fully, I wanted us to actually do that and practice that together. Can we just clap? Can we say thank you, God? Stand on our feet. Thank him for our breath. God, we thank you today that we have an opportunity. We praise you. You're a good God. God, you're amazing. We love you, God. Thank you. Yes. Woo! 
praise break. <laughs> All right, you can be seated. I think that that was really important for us to do, not only together, but in our own life, because our gratitude is the seed for greatness. What I'm grateful for will add value to my life. What I'm ungrateful for will detract or distract me from my purpose. The more value I have, the more I can add value. You know, Pastor Keith says, gratitude is an energy producing magnet that draws more of what you want towards you. Some of you are blocking your own blessings. Sometimes I definitely am blocking my blessings. And the thing that keeps me focused and keeps this magnet on me for value is whenever I'm able to have a grateful heart, to be grateful, to be thankful. Do you know that just because you get everything you want, it doesn't mean you're never going to face any issues? I think that's what everybody thinks when they get married. Like, I just want to find someone and get married. And I've done this twice where I have this delusional thought process about marriage. For those who don't know me, I've been married two times. And like both times, I was like, wow, <laughs> Instagram doesn't look like that in my real life. But I didn't capture those pictures to share with anybody. And for me, like we have these moments where maybe like we want to be in leadership or we want to get the promotion or we want to have this kid. But the first thing we do when we get those things is we complain about them. We like, we'll do anything to get it. And as soon as we get it, we're like, this is not what I thought leadership was. This is, I, this is not how long I thought I was going to have to work getting this promotion. I did not know that marriage was just going to be like this whole self-improvement process where I'm constantly having to be better. <laughs> These kids are draining me. I wanted them and I even maybe scientifically made them happen, but I am tired. We have these things we want, but as soon as we get them, we complain about them. You know, I have like kind of a gift. I don't even have to think about it or try to complain. It just comes natural. <laughs> it's a gift I'm trying to stop from happening now in my life. But I don't know about you, but sometimes, and some of you guys are sitting there like, I'm not like that. Probably just yesterday you were having a conversation with your friend where you were complaining and it felt really good. Or maybe you were on your way here and maybe you're the wife and you were waiting on your husband to be ready so you could leave for church. I just switched it up there for you. <laughs> for the girl's sake, you know. Uh, <laughs> we can always find something to complain about. But did you know that we have way more to be grateful for? I like the etymology of words, the structure of words, so I decided to break some of this down. So grateful is actually two different words. The first part of it means heavy, strength, to favor, grace. The second part means full of, having, characterized by an amount of volume contained or a handful. Gratitude, the actual word, means kindness awakened by a favor received. Grateful expresses the feeling and the readiness to manifest these feelings by acts. And it's spread out after a, over a long period of time um, after the favor actually happens. Thankfulness refers to immediate acknowledgement of a favor by words. But gratefulness is something that happens over time through your action. Now the word complain means to find fault, to blame, express dissatisfaction, criticize, to make a formal accusation or charge to an authority. Why do we complain? I'll tell you why I complain, because I only know myself. Maybe it'll apply to you. Because I deserve better. I should have better. But I, like, someone else can deal with that, but not me. And then when someone else is dealing with that, I'm like, girl, you just need to get the joy of the Lord in your heart. He is for you, so who can be against you? But then I'm like, not for me. Not, that's not happening in my life. It's not okay. Like, I know what to tell other people, but I can't apply it. And that's why it's so important to understand what gratitude does for you. Can you be grateful even when things don't work out, even when they don't look how you want them to? Because gratitude has nothing to do with your circumstance and it has everything to do with your perspective. It's easy to be grateful to God when things look good or feel good. But 
what about when his plans don't look like anything we want? You know, the Bible says, give thanks with a grateful heart. Greatness is not something you do, it's who you are. It's what you carry. In Colossians 3.15, it says, let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. It is for peace that you were chosen to be together in one body and always be thankful. So it's the peace of God, knowing who God is, understanding who God is, trusting who God is, that helps us control our thinking. And on the end, think about this. It says, oh, and always be thankful. That peace comes when you're thankful, when you're grateful. Everything that happens to you also happens for you. For those of you that don't know my story, um, actually four years ago, this next Thursday, the guy that I was married to, um, that I had known since he was nine, I was 11, grew up together, got married, fell in love, cheated on me about five months into our marriage, and then when I was on a missions trip, left me with our students at this church, left me, and then I had to deal with that like a couple months before we hit our first year anniversary. So for me, whenever I got to this point where it was like, how could this be useful in my life? How could this be a positive in my life? The thing that God reminded me of, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit more about this as I go, but the, th the thing that God reminded me of is that God never intends for you to go through something that you don't get something out of it. Complaining will suck your energy out, but gratitude will fill you up. Have you ever been around a complainer? They just suck the energy out of you. But you get around someone who's grateful, you're like, oh, they're happy. Why are you so happy? They might not even be doing as good as you. They like need a miracle too, but they're grateful. And so it fills them up and it looks attractable to us. You know, one of the things Pastor Keith also says is when you are grateful for what you have, you disempower self-pity based on what you don't have. A lot of us are so focused on what we don't have. And if you want your life to change, the power is in you taking action. Your action puts you towards your miracle. Gratitude, it adds power. Complaining adds weakness. A lot of times we don't think about this, but I'm going to use these uh, little cylinders behind me a couple times. I'll, I'll reference them. Every time you complain, you're adding something to your life. Every time you're grateful, you're adding something to your life. You know, people in this study that they did, it said that they never felt joyful unless they were grateful. The people who felt joyful always started with gratitude. Because it's not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us joyful. Your words matter and they create your world. I don't know if you realize that. God created the world with words and we do the same thing every day. In Numbers 14, 1 through 4, and then also in 28, we see this picture of the Israelites where they've been delivered from slavery. They've been brought into the place where they're headed towards the promised land. Now, that journey should have taken them about 11 days. It took them 40 years. Isn't that a lot like our life? Guess what kept them from the promise? Their mouth, their thinking. And we do the same thing. So let me tell you what they're saying in the scripture. They're going to put it up on the screen, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. They're sitting there. They're getting all together. They're upset. They're like, we should have died in slavery or let's die now in the desert. Actually, let's go back to slavery. That sounds like a better option. I know we were asking for God to deliver us for so many years, and he did. But now we have something to complain about because we're not happy. Like, in this scenario, just so you know, like, God's giving them food. He's giving them, like, water. He's giving them, like, bread from the sky. I don't really know how that all works. But, like, he's giving them every single thing they need, but yet they find something to complain about. And then they say something like, we should choose another leader. Let's just go back to Egypt. And here's what God says back to them. Here's what I am announcing. I am the Lord. You can be sure that I live. And here is what you can be just as sure of. I will do to you the very thing that I have heard you say. That is sobering. <laughs> None of those people that were complaining got into the promised land. And you will never reach your promise as long as you fill yourself with complaining. You do not have to feel grateful to be grateful. 
What if where God has you doesn't look great, but he has you there for a reason? Because greatness is not a title or position, it is a disposition. It is who you are on the inside, it is what you carry. It doesn't matter how important you think you are, what title you have, who your family is, how much money you have, or how others see you. The question that I have for you today is, can God work in you? I have found that God often uses my problems to not only strengthen my relationship with him, but to also work out things that are not working in me. You have to be willing to step into greatness. Be willing to wait till the end of something and see how God's plan unfolds before you jump to a conclusion. It's funny because in, in Ecclesiastes 7, 8, it says it's better to finish something than it is to start it. It's better to be gentle and patient than it is to be proud and impatient. But how often do we get in something where we're like, oh, no, this is not God's plan. You know, it's really only often looking back that you can see God at work in your life. I know that's how it is in my life. I look back and I go, wow, God never left me. But when it was happening, you know what I said to God out loud? I'm bold. I said, God, I'd like to see you use this. Like, I've spent my life following you. I saved myself for marriage. I did it all the right ways. And this is my return? I'd like to see you use it. And guess what I know the enemy was trying to do? He was trying to get me filled with the wrong things. Throughout, like, the beginning of my life, I know we all grow up in families and we all have our own situations and our seasons. But for me, the enemy tried to hurt me early. Like, in my family, I face things that no one else has faced. And I'm sure you have that kind of stuff too. That doesn't make you better or worse. That should just show you that God has an amazing plan for you. The enemy's trying to stop it. Trying to get you full of the wrong things. Because I've encountered, I've encountered rejection at a high level. I've encountered sexual abuse and abuse at a, at a level. And for me, like, dealing with those things, they weren't people inside of my family, thank God. They were people in the church. They were imperfect people. But what I know is that when you allow the wrong things in, you will be led by the wrong things. So imagine your life as a container like this. You're meant to be filled with joy, with peace, with love, with faith, with hope. But there's not space for both the negative and the positive. You won't have space for peace when you're filled with worry. Your container, if it's full with the wrong things, you won't have room for anything else. So you have to give no place to the enemy. So while I was in this hotel room in New York after my husband had left, and I'm like talking to God, like real. I don't know, if, have you guys ever had a real conversation with God? If you haven't, try it. So like I'm like, God, I'd like to see you use this. Guess what my next statement after that was? I went, you know what, devil? You're going to not get one day for me so God can use it. You see, it takes our action in order for God to be able to be powerful in our weakness. In Ephesians 4.27, I love this scripture. It says, don't give the devil a way to defeat you. You see, the devil has no power in your life that you don't give him. Like, like Pastor Whitney said up here, you have the power of God inside of you. You're powerful. So every time you have those moments where you're like, the devil's just getting after me. He's just tempting me. You're letting him because you have power that's stronger than his power. So we have to realize, do not give the devil a way to defeat you. It says, when you talk, don't say anything bad. But say the good things people need. Whatever will help them grow stronger. Then what you say will be a blessing to those who hear you. And don't make the mistake, oh, and don't make the Holy Spirit sad. I didn't really know I could make the Holy Spirit sad. And don't make the Holy Spirit sad. God gave you his spirit as proof that you belong to him and he will keep you safe until the day he makes you free. Did you know that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? A lot of people see this as a conscience, you know, that feeling you get. You can push away the Holy Spirit. You can push away his voice, but you have access to him. You have access to his wisdom, to his guidance, to his power. And guess what I started to do in that major season of my life four years ago? I started to go... I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know if you've ever been there, but I'm like, I don't, I don't really know what to do now. Like, can someone write a Christian book on this? Because, like, I don't have anybody to ask. Like, I don't have anybody around me that's done this and is healthy. 
Guess what the Bible tells us? The Holy Spirit is your teacher. And he can bring things to your remembrance that you don't even know has been poured inside of you. But we have to control what's in our container. I'm not going to give fear, anger, or unforgiveness room in my life. I don't have room for it. If I want to be full of great things, if I want to be full of God, if I want to be someone who is great, I have to be filled with the right things. Don't continue to let negative things, like unworthy things, take up your space because you need room for the good things. Take inventory on what you're giving space to. In Psalms 103, it says, I will praise the Lord. Deep down inside me, I will praise him. I will praise him because his name is holy. I will praise the Lord. I won't forget anything he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my sickness. He saves my life from going down into the grave. His faithful and tender love makes me like a king. He satisfies me with good things I desire. Then I feel young and strong again, just like an eagle. You know, when you're not being grateful, you're going to feel weak. You're going to feel like, I don't know where to go from here. This says, he makes me feel like a king. Heck yeah. I want some of that. What's my role in that? I've got to praise the Lord. I have to remember what he's done for me. Is that not enough that he's forgiven our sins, healed all our sickness, been faithful, loved me, done everything? I mean, I wouldn't be here. Thank you, God. That's, that's something to be grateful for. <laughs> and when you make room for God, he will fill you with good things. Do you have enough room for what God's trying to do in your life and through your life? We say things like, I know God wants me to have peace and he wants me to have joy and he wants me to have a sound mind, but I just don't feel it. Maybe you're filling yourself with the wrong things and you have no room for what he wants to give you. You know what's interesting is that God's promises are not optional. They're like there for you, but we think of them as optional because we don't choose them. We choose our hurt. We choose our pain. We choose our frustration over joy, over peace. Like that's right there for us and we're like, mm, no, nah, I'd rather be filled with anger. Mm, no, nah, I'd rather be filled with fear. And sometimes we don't even realize we're making this choice. But what has your name on it in this life and beyond will not go to anyone else. You have to make room for it, though. Worry will make you weak. Fear will control you. Bitterness will shorten your life. In Proverbs 14.30, it says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. What does that mean? I've got to know who my God is. I can't get all, like, in a tiffy when things happen and be like, <laughs> I gotta go, no, God is more powerful, stronger, bigger, greater, higher than any of my problems, any of my diagnosis, anything. So you can have kind of like, I get this picture of like a relaxed attitude because you know who your God is. You're gonna live longer if you act that way. Give no place to the negative. You know the enemy will try to poison your future by getting you to focus on what is not right in your life. I don't know if you're like me in this, but like I can be like, that is not right. You're not right. That's not right. This is where we need to go. Chill out. Like for me, I don't see myself as like a competitive person. I just might hurt you if you get in my way. So, like, I don't care about games. Like, you know, people play games and stuff. I'm like, I'm out to win life. Like, I don't care about a game. Like, <laughs> so for me, like, even growing up with my brother and my sister, like, I punched out my brother's first teeth. And, like, my sister, I was always really aggressive with her. And I'm still working on it. <laughs> In general, I'm glad I have a very strong husband now. He lets me, like, punch him sometimes, but for fun. <laughs> don't worry, I don't hurt him. And so... The thing that I'm learning is instead of responding with my passion and my intensity and getting upset and saying, that's not right, I've understood now that I can thank God even for my pain. Because guess what it does? When you get in pain, you can either go under or you can go over. But when you go over, you're going to gain something that no one else can take away, and that's intimacy with God and power. And out of your greatest pain will come your greatest anointing. But you've got to get full with the right things. The people that don't deal with themselves and deal with their issues and their hard times will be full of the wrong things. And that's exactly what the enemy wants for you. You know the enemy has a plan for you? A lot of people don't like to talk about that. God has a greater plan for you. You get to choose which one you want to be a part of. 
You know, in John 10, 10, it says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come so that they may have life. I want them to have it in the fullest possible way. God wants you to have life and life more abundantly, but you have to choose to be a part of that plan. Being grateful adds power to your life that you would not have. If it doesn't serve God's purpose, he wouldn't have allowed it in your life. He only allows in your life what he will use, but you have to let him use it. You know, Philippians uh, 4, 6 through 9, some of you guys know the scripture. It's worded a little bit differently in this version. But my brother, uh, you know, he talks about love a lot and stuff. And like, it's fine. My motto is love fiercely. He's a really good lover. That's why I'm saying it's fine because like I'm working on it. But like my motto is love fiercely because whenever I was in sixth grade, this is a real story. I told the interns it this week. But someone said, are you a lover or are you a fighter? This is a teacher. And I raised my hand in sixth grade and I said, um, excuse me. I disagree with this argument entirely because to be a lover, you have to be a fighter. Like, how are you going to love and not fight? You have to fight to love. Like, it is not easy to love people. It's not easy to love yourself. Like, if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love other people? And that's, like, hard. So I have this motto that I live by that is, like, literally tattooed on my body. It says, love fiercely. Because I want to remind myself to love fiercely, to love God fiercely, to love people fiercely. To let my life exude that love. Now, sometimes my fears gets up before the love. <laughs> Just got to work on it. But my brother sent me this scripture because he's really smart and, like, loving and stuff. And right after my husband left, the first one, he sent me this. <laughs> the, the second one's right there. He's the good one. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> He sent me, thank you, Cole. Okay, so he sent me the scripture, and I'm going to be real with you. I was offended. Do you ever read scripture and get offended? <laughs> I do because it puts me in my place. So he sends me this, and it says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated with prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before the Lord. With overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on what is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectable, pure and holy, merciful and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Follow the example of all that we know and have been imparted to you. And the God of peace will be with you in all these things. So whenever the guy that I was married to before left, I'm not like, I want to think on lovely peacefulness and stuff, like let God know my stuff, like he already knows, and I'm upset, and I want to like think about what's wrong and how this can happen to anybody else, but this shouldn't happen to me, and you know we think like that. But what I've come to find, even like through the scripture and through my life, is what you hold on to will hold on to you. So if you're not holding on to something good, you better drop it. Like I'm dropping my complaining. You know, Joel Osteen says, it's not affecting them. It's infecting you. And for me, it was super tempting to be really upset at that situation with the guy I was married to. Because I was like, what is wrong with you? Like, we're Christians. And like, you should know better. And, but guess what? Instead, I focused on letting go and trusting God and not holding on. Like some of you guys know what this is like when you're driving around and all of a sudden like someone's following you and like honking at you and using fingers at you. My mom taught me that all my fingers are made by God and the world makes them bad. So just using fingers at me and things. And like for me, I don't understand why people get so upset when they drive because you're just driving. And if that makes you really that upset, other stuff's going on. But, like, I have this thing inside of me that, like, whenever I feel that people are intense or upset, I tend to try to diffuse it. Like, if you've ever been with me in a store, if someone's like, yes, huh, like, first of all, those people probably aren't even greeted by other people. They're, like, treated like things that just scan things for you, you know, or hand you a bill. So it's like anytime someone's having a bad day, I usually am like, hi, Sophia, how are you today? And she's like, I'm fine. I'm like, great, your hair is amazing. And I like try to like bring it up, you know. Because for me, like some people don't treat those people right. 
And we, as the people of God, need to notice people. They are real and alive and breathing and they're gifts from the Lord. But I want to challenge you, no matter what kind of people you encounter, I want you to have this picture. Some people are like garbage trucks. And when they get full of junk, it usually overflows and we end up picking up their garbage. They were full of frustration, full of anger, full of other stuff. You don't have to take some of it. Be a container that holds treasure, not trash. Some of us today need to let go of the trash of our past, let go of our unforgiveness, let go of our anger, let go of our worry. That's filling you up and it's taking up space that God wants. He wants to fill it with good. Being grateful looks a lot like just finding the good even when it doesn't look good. I may be divorced, but God. I may be single, but God. I may be sick, but God. I may be in financial ruin, but God. Too often our butts are bigger than the power of God in our life. We have so many butts. And the only but that should exist in our life is, hey, this may look unpleasant or negative, but God. You know, one of the things my dad's always taught me is whatever happened before, but doesn't matter. So you got to watch where you say it. Like, I love you, but <laughs> don't say that. But anything, anything in your life, tag but God to it. Guess what? God matters more. His power matters more. His promise matters more. So what we focus on, what we focus on will expand in our life. And the facts may not have changed, but if you can change your focus, the facts will work for you. What you are full of, you will be led by. You might not even realize what you're full of right now. You're full of it. Is it good? If it's not producing good, I have to tell you what's in you will come out of you. So it will show you what is inside of you. When pressure happens, that's how you know what's inside of you. God wants us to be full of the right things. The enemy wants us to be full of the wrong things. The parts of you that are not grateful are the parts of you that cannot be great. They are literally held back because your priority is on the problem over God's power, over his promise. There's nobody that can make you grateful. There's no one that can make you great. You have to make the choice. Some of you guys have maybe heard of Viktor Frankl. He lived in a concentration camp during the Nazi regime, and they took away everything he had. They took away his clothes, his possessions, his family, his food, everything. He lived on barely any food and would work over 14 hours in the snow in, like, no clothes. A lot of the people around him were dying, and many people considered suicide, and he even considered suicide at one point. But one day he realized that even though they had taken away everything from him, they could take away his family, they could take away his possessions, they could take away his health, there was one thing that they could not take away from, and that was his freedom to choose how to respond. And he said, I can choose to be happy regardless of what happens. This is where all of the gratitude studies came out of. Your next level... What God wants to do in and through you is on the other side of your ability to see who God is over what it looks like right now. And live like you're grateful for who he is and all he's done. Because you can be in a terrible situation, but you can know how good God is and still be grateful. God's gifts cannot bring you joy. Your gratitude of the gifts can only bring you joy. You can be surrounded by goodness and miss it. And some of us right now are living in our, appraise, are in our praise report and we can't even say thank you. We're living in an answered prayer right now and we're complaining. If you got what you wanted right now, would you even be able to handle it? Like some of us want to be millionaires in here, but we can't even handle $5. Some of us want to get married in here and have a healthy marriage. We can't even lead ourselves. You know, Real Talk Kim, whenever she came, she said something that really challenged me. She said, hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. And you attract whatever you are. You're going to attract unhealthy if you're unhealthy. So thank God you haven't met them yet. Because you would get that back. You know, your preferences can make you miss God's purpose. It can make you miss his provision. Because you wanted it this way. You wanted it with that person. You wanted it then. You know, I want to tell you a story that happens in 2 Kings 4. There's this widow, and she's lost her husband, and the, the debt collectors are coming to take her sons to put them into slavery. Back in the day, if you owed a debt, they could literally come take the next generation out of your home and make them slaves until you paid off the debt. 
So she's freaking out. A prophet comes through her city and she goes to the prophet and she says, sir, I need your help. I've lost my husband. I don't have anything and they're gonna take my sons. What he asks her is he says, well, what do you have? She doesn't get offended. She doesn't get upset with him. She just says, all I have, like literally all I have is a tiny bit of oil left. I don't have anything left. And he says, okay, go get as many containers as you can. Go get as many vessels as you can. Like lock yourself behind a door and fill up the containers. She didn't ask him a bunch of questions. She didn't say like, by what time? Like how many should I get? The net collectors are here. She just went and got the vessels and shut the door with her sons and started pouring the oil in the vessels. Now the oil in the Bible in this verse, it represents the power and the spirit of God. You guys know we need the Holy Spirit to stay free. I saw this quote on Instagram the other day. It said, someone asked me if, they need, if we really need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. <laughs> I need the Holy Spirit. And so the thing I want to tell you today, the interesting thing about this story is whenever he said, what do you have? Her answer was in the house. Your answer is in the house. You've got to get in the house. Now, she didn't get upset when he said, what do you have? Like, what if she was like, I only have this much oil, why? Or she didn't even tell him what she had. Some of us, we have what we need for God to multiply, but we're not willing to put it into his hands. She had to take action. And the interesting thing in this story is that whenever she stopped, like, gathering the vessels, that was the limit of her blessing. So in the story, behind the door, she's pouring, she's pouring. She asks her son, she says, do we have any more vessels? They say, no, we don't have any more. That's when the oil stopped. Some of us were not giving God much to work with. I wonder what would have happened if she got more vessels. The oil, the power of God never runs out. We have to be willing to be open so that we can be filled. What if your miracle and your answer was on the other side of your obedience? What do you have, he said to her, Use what God's given you. Go borrow vessels that required action. Empty vessels, something that can be used. Don't just gather a few. You're your own limit. Shut the door behind you. Sometimes it requires separation and saying no to some people and things that are not for us. Bring me another vessel. There were no more. That's when the oil stopped. So I want to ask you one more time what I asked you earlier. Can God use you? Because what is inside of the vessel is the most important part. It doesn't matter how talented you are, how much you have it together, doesn't matter if you're perfect, doesn't matter how old or young you are, you just have to be ready to be used by God. The problem is not can God do something. The issue many times is that we're not in a place to even receive what he has for us. We're so focused on the sons being taken away. The debt collectors are here, this is not fair. God, can't you take care of the debt collectors? Wipe them out. <laughs> the prophet wasn't even concerned with that in the story. He just said, you already have it. So I want to tell you this because you might not realize it. You already have your miracle. You've got to use what you've been given. You've got to place it in the hands of God. You see, whenever my story happened four years ago, you know, I found out that we need to pray and we need to talk to God about it, but God actually knows what we need. He knows what he's doing. In my life, I learned what I wanted was not what God had that was best for me. He had something planned ahead that I couldn't see, so what you want may not be wrong, but what if God's plans are beyond what you can see? For me, at the beginning, I was praying like, God, help my husband, help him to think this way. His, his mind's not right, like help him, help him, God. Restore my marriage. And after a couple months, God started to move in my heart. Because I believe in fighting for your marriage. I believe in fighting for what's best. I believe in fighting for God. But what God began to lead me to is to pray, God, I want what you want. God, I'm submitted to you. I'll follow you. We say things like, God, I need a miracle. God, I want you to do something in my life. But he's just looking for something that he can multiply in your life so he can do something. But we give him so little to multiply. We have to make room for what God wants to do in us. Pastor Keith says it's impossible to be grateful and unhappy at the same time. And studies show that that's true. You know, Dr. Robbie is about to be here in our church and 
He's gonna do a two week part series and if you've never heard him, get here, trust me. Like I said this to the guys in the back for a service, he saved my brain. He really did, he's very smart. He was here the first like week that I came back after the guy I was married to left. And I sat down with him because I was having these cyclical thoughts. And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced anything like this, but I had faced depression before early on in my life, but I'd never faced like panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And you feel like you're literally out of control and dying. And so I had these like really comforting thoughts that were like, okay, this is my life. This is my life. And then it turned into, this is my life. This is my life. I can't believe this is my life. And I would get in this panic. And so I asked him, I said, my dad's always taught me how to lead myself. I know how to lead myself, but I can't lead myself out of this. And it's very frustrating. I'm out of control. And he said to me, the strongest neural pathway is fear. The only way to stop anxiety, depression, and panic is to change the neural pathway. The only stronger neural pathway than fear is gratitude. When he, when he told me that, I'm gonna be real, I told him that sounds really dumb. I was in a, you know, a really real place. But you know what I started to do? Instead of just saying, that's, that's dumb, I'm not gonna apply that. I tried it. And every time I started to get into that cycle, every time I started to get into that panic, every time I started feeling out of control, I just started going, thank you. This doesn't make sense, but thank you because I have breath, I have a chance. You, you love me and he loved me looking back. He loved me so much that he took me from something that I thought was for me and he upgraded me and he gave me better. And guess what? Maybe he's doing the same thing for you right now. Or maybe he has and you haven't even realized it. If they walked away, let them because maybe they couldn't go to your next level. God loves that person. He loves that person. Let him love them. Let people come around them, but understand that God loves you. And he's not gonna let you stay with someone somewhere doing something that's not going to bring you forward. So we have to get on board and start filling ourselves with the right things because the enemy will try to get you to be filled with the wrong things. But appreciation, gratitude, and thankfulness are the answer to most of our issues. Power is released when you are grateful because you give God something to work with. Many of us are walking, like I said in a praise report right now, and we can't even say thank you to God. We don't even let our mouths say it. We're just like, yeah, of course I expect this. I wanted it. God has given us everything. You don't, you don't pay for your breath. Thank God we don't have to count our breaths and pay God back. It just, it works. So if stuff's working today in any way, we have something to say thank you. So thank God, even when what you want doesn't happen. Maybe they left you, maybe they hurt you, maybe you're still single, maybe you got passed over for a promotion, maybe you got fired, maybe your healing hasn't happened yet. But the Bible says, don't thank God for all things, thank Him in all things. Because He is still God in the midst of everything. It says in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 5, that is His perfect plan that you thank Him. So if you wanna know what's God's perfect plan for me, how do you, how do you be great? For God, be grateful. I'm gonna tell you this story and I'm gonna end. It's about a, the cracked pot. It's an ancient story. Maybe you've heard it before. An elderly Chinese woman, she had these two pots she would carry with a pole over her shoulders and every day she'd go get water. One of them was cracked, the other one was perfect. She would get back to her house and the, the pot that was perfect would be like, I'm so proud of myself, I carried all the water. Now the cracked one, at one point, it it's said to the old woman, I'm ashamed of myself because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to the house and I'm not able to fulfill my design, my purpose. The old woman smiled and replied, did you notice that there were flowers on your side of the path, but not on the other pot side? I have always known about your flaw, so I planted flower seeds on your side of the path. And every day while we walked back home, you watered them and made them grow for two years. I have been able to pick these beautiful flowers and decorate the table and give to my friends and neighbors without you being just the way you are. There would have been no special beauty and grace in our homes and lives. What we perceive as imperfections or cracks create something amazing with the power of God. You know, I recently, in the past couple years, I, I recently asked God, I said, God, 
how many times am I gonna be broken? How many times am I gonna be hurt? Like, you know when you get to the point that you're like, I don't know how much I can take. How am I gonna be grateful for this? It's grateful for who, not what. And so for me, God responded to me so lovingly and sweetly, and it's taken me a while to process it. But I said, how much more can I be broken? And he said, the more broken you are, the more I get to use. But I have to put it in his hands for it to be useful. Otherwise, it's just gonna hurt me. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I love the scripture. It says, but he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its perfect and full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Jesus Christ living in me. God is so faithful. I'm so grateful this morning to tell you that I can look back on things in my life, not because I was perfect, not because I did everything right, but I can look back and see God's faithfulness and be grateful. It's not gonna be natural for you to be grateful. It's gonna be natural for you to complain. It's gonna be natural for you to see what's not right and what's not okay in your life. But God knows the cracks that you have. He knows the flaws that you have. He knows it's not working in your life. And guess what? He is actively at work and has already prepared the way to victory. So everything you see as a flaw, he sees as a gain. His weakness, like the weakness that we have, the weakness, we bring it to him, it exchanges into power when you put it in his hands. So we gotta get full of the right things so we're led by the right things. We gotta get full of the right things so the right things come out. We gotta get full of great things so we can be great. I'm so grateful today that God loved me, that he's, that he's guided me, that he's cared for me. And you're here today alive. No matter where you've come from, no matter what you've been through, you're here. And that means that there is a possibility of greatness ahead. It might not look great right now, it might not feel great right now, but I wanna challenge you. Put whatever you have in the hands of God. Take out the trash, take inventory of your vessel. Be a person that God can use. We hear the word use and we can, we can exchange it to mean like being used. Every desire that you have in your heart, God put it there. You don't have to worry about figuring out how it's gonna happen. All you have to do is figure out how to, how to be filled by the right things. And the answer to that is block the negativity, block the unforgiveness, block the anger, and go, God, I'm gonna choose this instead. I'm gonna hold on to this instead. So can we do something together? I, I wanna go back to that scripture in the beginning where we talked about praising the Lord together and we stood up. There's this song that says, all my life you've been faithful. All my life, you've been good. And I think we can take a second and practice this together because when you realize how good God is, it doesn't matter what's happening around you because guess what the Bible says? It says he goes before us. He's already had the victory, so now we just have to walk in it. So today, let's stand up and let's sing this together to God. faithful sing it to him all my life you have been so so
the goodness of God. God, we thank you today that you have always been faithful. No matter what it's looked like, no matter what it looks like right now, you have never changed who you are. You are still the God who is more than enough. You are still the God who's bigger and stronger and more powerful than any storm we're going to face. You are a God who sees things before they ever happen because you don't live in our timeline. You don't live in our thought process. The Bible says your ways are higher, your thoughts are higher. So today, God, we come up higher. We open up our mindset. We don't get stuck in what shouldn't be or what hasn't been. But God, today we are grateful. God, today we step into our greatness because we are full of gratitude. If you're a person and you're dealing with something right now, or maybe this word resonated with you, I just want you to open up your hands like this, like you're receiving. God, we thank you right now that you are giving us everything we need, the miracle that we need. God, the thing that we need is in the house. God, I pray that we would use what we've been given that we wouldn't look to the right or to the left of what people are getting or what's happening in their life because God, you're working very, very intimately on our life, on our heart, on our mind. So God, I pray that you would pour out your love, that you would pour out your peace, that you would pour out your understanding and your wisdom, that we would know and trust that you have us. It says in the Bible, in the palm of your hand. God, you care for us so much and today I speak healing over broken hearts. God, I speak a sound mind where people have been struggling in their mind. God, I speak strength into people because I know what it feels like to be given strength by you. And God, you have been so faithful. And I live, God, now as a testament of your faithfulness that where I thought that there were ruins, where I thought that things were over, God, now is a throne for you to be glorified on. God, it's a guidepost for people to see where they can be healed. And God, you're gonna do the same thing in other people's life. God, the ruins where the enemy thought he has won, you're just setting up an altar. You're just setting up their purpose. You're just setting up their calling. God, you're just setting up their anointing and the enemy can't do anything about it. So God, we're not gonna give any power to the enemy today. We're taking our power back. We're taking our greatness back. God, we're gonna get full of the right things. And today, everything changes in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.